And a taxi filled with explosives basically rammed into the back of this bus. Um, and that resulted in seven, um, seven of our employees dying, being killed on the spot, and 15 injured, some badly, but some permanently, actually. Welcome back to Crisis What Crisis, the podcast that aims to guide you towards a more resilient life and whatever it might throw at you. If this is your first time with us, then please hit subscribe wherever you're watching or listening. It really does help make sure that these, I hope, useful conversations are shared as widely as possible. My guest today, I'm delighted to say, is Saab Maseni, founder and CEO of the Moby Media Group, but a man who has operated at the coalface of crisis for more than two decades. Saad is the son of an Afghan diplomat born in London, but who spent his childhood years in Kabul. And following the Soviet invasion in 1980, Saad's family sought political asylum in Australia. After a very successful career in corporate finance, Saad decided in 2002 that his future was as an entrepreneur and business owner, not in New York or London, but following the US invasion in the challenging environment of Afghanistan. Since then, with his brothers, Saad has built the Moby Group, which created and runs a number of media businesses, including the radio station Armin FM and Tolo TV, which brought popular programming and live news to Afghanistan for the first time. Then came other ventures, including the creation of the Afghan Football Premier League for both men and women, astonishingly, and Afghan Star, a pop idol-style show watched by millions. The support and praise of presidents and prime ministers in the West followed, the importance of Saad's work properly recognised in Washington and in London. He was named on Time magazine's top 100 list and by the BBC for his work battling gender inequality. But against a backdrop of conflict, terrorism and political failure, Saad has faced crisis, professional and personal, as he worked to keep Afghans informed and entertained. In 2016, seven Moby employees were killed in a targeted bomb attack. Saad himself has faced regular death threats and at times has been forced to stay out of the country. And almost exactly two years ago, after the sudden and dramatic withdrawal of US troops, Saad and his colleagues faced a new challenge, the return of the Taliban. Tolo continued to operate despite the constant threat of shutdown or takeover from the country's new rulers who are, let's say, not exactly famed for their love of accurate reporting and entertainment. Despite having witnessed firsthand the horrors of extremism and conflict, Saad is also a profound pragmatist, a man who can tell us what it is to negotiate, I suspect almost on a daily basis, with the Taliban to stay on air. And he's some, somehow done so whilst continuing to campaign against what one commentator has described as the gender apartheid of the new regime. When the Taliban arrived, Saad put the leadership on air, a Taliban leader interviewed by a female Afghan journalist live on television. A truly historic moment for the country. That that journalist has now had to leave Afghanistan, however, speaks to the challenges women are now facing there again. Over the years, Saad has also worked closely with and argued with senior allied military leaders and politicians in the corridors of power around the world. He is a man with views, and I would urge you to follow at Saad Maseni on Twitter or X or whatever it's called today uh, if you are interested in what's happening in Afghanistan. Furious at the chaotic and sudden American withdrawal, Saad said recently, if the White House could erase the word Afghanistan from the dictionary, they would. So this is a conversation with someone who has operated at the epicentre of a country in crisis for more than two decades, who has witnessed the sometimes catastrophic impact of errors made by foreign powers, and who has seen how attention can frequently and very quickly switch away from Afghanistan, just as it is now with the eyes of the world, uh, perhaps understandably on the conflict in Ukraine. It's a conversation about how you progress, how you survive as a businessman in that kind of environment, about how you set aside the unravelling human drama that is day-to-day -day life in Afghanistan to stay strategic and focused on a simple, important purpose, to tell the Afghan people the truth. Saad Maseni, welcome to Crisis What Crisis. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Um, very well indeed, thank you. I'm very, uh, very uh, excited to be having this conversation with you, which has been long planned, uh, but as it turns out, um, very timely, because as I mentioned, we are fast approaching the two-year anniversary of the, uh, of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. After uh, almost 24 months then of Taliban rule, how would you describe the current state of the country? 
Well, uh, it's not that simple, like most things. Um, there have been some gains. Um, security obviously is better. You know, we, we were losing up to 200 individuals a day uh, when there was an ongoing conflict uh, mm -hmm. between the Taliban and allied and Afghan forces. So it's, 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 you know, the relative peace that the country is enjoying, especially in the countryside, is a relief to many, many and I, I would put that as a sort of a gain. Um, corruption is nowhere near as bad as it was, and I'm sure corruption does exist. And if we're to believe the international community, including the Americans, um, the Taliban have dealt pretty seriously with the with the opium business, um, to the point that uh, cultivation is now illegal, uh, and most farmers are unable to cultivate, uh, um, you know, mostly opi opioids, but as well as uh, marijuana plants and so forth. So that's. Those are gains. Mm. Um, the state seems to be acting more responsibly in terms of uh, tax, you know, collecting uh, tax revenues. As a matter of fact, despite the economy having collapsed, they're collecting as much money as the Ashraf Ghani government, which right. is extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, on the flip side, half the population, women and girls, uh, are forced to stay home now. Uh, at least in terms of being able to work with governments and NGOs and attend schools, there is apparently, there are more women now in the workforce because many are being forced to, you know, create small cottage businesses and mm -hmm. so forth to be able to survive. So even that on the issue of women and women's uh, apartheid, as you, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's not that simple. But nonetheless, it's just the idea that you can erase half the population. It's just it's 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 beyond uh, um, you know uh, comprehension in in the 21st century, and that's a real real challenge for the country. And of course, the government is not inclusive. Uh, minorities are not really uh, included. Um, Non-Taliban are not included. Even if there are minorities, they belong to the Taliban movement. So you know, this country of 40 million individuals is not truly represented by the state today. And of course, people feel, don't feel included, that's for sure. Um, I, people tend to ask me, is it as bad as the 1990s? So far, uh, probably not. But it's, it's constantly changing. And I think one of the concerns that we have is that it's, you know, the, in the initial phase when, when there, there were, you know, the, you know there, was, there were signs of hope, basically. Uh, were they, were they, were they different? Were they different then, or was it just a lack of bandwidth, their inability to impose their will? They are slowly becoming more restrictive, but at the same time, um, the leadership in Kabul—they're mixing with the ordinary in, uh, in the, uh, folks on, on the streets and government offices and so forth. Perhaps they're even moderating as individuals, but the policies themselves are becoming more restrictive. So mm. we just need to watch the space in the coming months and you know, weeks and days in order to see well, how, you know, this sort of tug of war within the Taliban, which we can talk about more. But the, but the s standard of day-to-day of -day life yeah. is, has, has definitely gone backwards. I mean, the UN say that 30 of those 40 million are in dire need of aid just to get to the essentials in life. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of, the, just, just getting through the day, the basics of life. Yeah. Would you say have gone backwards? That would you absolutely. Yeah. Well, the problem was that the West they uh, withdrew in a very chaotic manner. Then, in the two weeks between August fifteenth and the end of August, they basically airlifted our best and brightest. I mm. mean, um, sort of uh, uh, you know, flight of of our you know most talented individuals, like the likes of which we haven't seen before. And thirdly, the imposition of sanctions basically brought the country to its knees. Mm. So it wasn't just a question of just getting out. It was also these, these sanctions hurt the Afghan people, essentially. I, I, you know, I understand the argument in terms of not rewarding the Taliban regime while they have these very draconian uh, policies in place. Nonetheless, it's been you know, a triple whammy for, yeah. for the nation. So yes, people are on the verge of starvation. Every winter or you know, months before winter, we have this debate again. 
what will the world do in terms of the you know 20 or 30 million people who are on the verge of starvation and it's a sort of a groundhog day scenario it's a repeat every single year and i think one of the things that we you know we often talk about is why engagement's important and why the world needs to be a little bit more involved to at least help the people of the country mm. uh, in terms of you know uh, making the economy more resilient and helping with livelihoods and so forth in a um in a truly bizarre video, the British uh, politician Tobias Elwood, um, who has you know made some very sensible interventions mm. in the past, uh, uh, he, he got himself into trouble by suggesting that life you know is improving for Afghans under the Taliban, in broad terms, you know, um, seemingly blind to the um, you know to the picture that you've just painted. Um, his video was put to work pretty quickly by the by the Taliban mm. I mean they they embraced it as you did perhaps mm. e e expect what did you what that, did you... that's always a warning sign it's isn't always it? a warning <laughs> sign it's never a good never a good, yeah. never a good sign uh, what did you what did you make of it I think his message sort of makes sense about engagement I think you have to engage with that core cool message of what he was the trying core to message say. of engaging with it and engagement doesn't mean recognition engagement means just you, you talk to you know the people on the other keep side. Talking. Yeah. You, you gotta keep talking. You got to keep talking, especially to you know with your enemies yeah. or to your enemies. Um, so engagement, that message is right. But for him to paint this picture of this, you know, this rosy picture of what's transpiring on the ground, came across as perhaps naive. And I think the video contained this sort of cheesy music, background music, with, which further infuriated um, people, in particular afghan minorities and women so i think the core message is not a bad one i think the the uk also has checked out uh completely your government is involved engaged in so many other things china ukraine the economy and so forth afghanistan is certainly not on the list mm -hmm. but also i think it's been a scarring experience for most dealing with afghanistan i think most british diplomats who are involved in afghanistan suffer from ptsd it was such a chaotic situation. You don't, and it, say, you, don't was, that, you don't say that lightly. No, and it was, yeah. and, I, and I think it was, it was humiliating. And it was, it was a conversation I had with John McCain many, many years ago. I became quite good friends with him, and he talked about engaging, re-engaging with the Vietnamese. And he said, as soon as he got out of the prison, he he was, you know, you know, determined to bridge that gap to get the Americans to engage with the Vietnamese. And he said it took almost two decades because the humiliation of defeat. In Vietnam, which just psychologically made it so difficult for the you know, political establishment to move on, and I yeah. think we're seeing something similar with Afghanistan. You know, the, the humiliation that the West suffered. I mean, it was a case and the, of and the losses <coughs> as well. I mean, right? the losses, the sacrifice, the money that they spent, and it, it was a sort of case study of how we can transform a country. And then all of a sudden, you know. It was the scenes and, you know, the 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 the, 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 Va the scenes in Vietnam, remember the mm. helicopter trying to airlift people Saigon, from that yeah. building? I mean, the scenes of people falling out of airplanes. Mm. I mean, it's just, there's no comparison. Mm. So that humiliation was captured by, you know, m you know, cameras and so forth. You know, this is a different day and age, of course. And I think it's going to be very difficult for the West to, to re-engage in a meaningful way. Um, I mean, you, you hinted at it there in your relationship with McCain, but I mean, you, you have relationships in Washington at the highest levels. You know, you are someone that the West has often turned to for uh, analysis, understanding, and everything else that you're able hmm. to bring in terms of um, the situation in Afghanistan. You were furious with the nature of the withdrawal and the, and the, and the, and the way in which it was executed, weren't you? Yeah, I just read um, this book, excellent book by Martin Indyk on Kissinger's Middle East, you know, the shuttle diplomacy, mm. uh, which looking back now, 50 years on, uh, was pretty effective in you know, keeping the peace between Israel and, and its neighbors and how ne he negotiated. Now, that's the model of how you negotiate and how they negotiated with the Taliban is the exact opposite. They had a deal with the Taliban before getting a deal with the other side. And then they basically, you know, announced that they're going to leave and and why why were they surprised you know the the the, the nature of the collapse i mean why would you be surprised that the, the country collapses in the way it, that it did in afghanistan it's always been the case of just people switching sides if you you know radio ahead and say we're going to leave in six months it's very natural for 
you know, Afghan military commanders, local warlords and tribal chiefs to basically say, for us to survive, we need to switch sides. So it's just... It's, There's it's, also a tremendous loss of life amongst the Afghan army as well. I mean, right? they, I mean they, they, the fighting continued for... A lot of people lost their lives in that interim period as well, right? So it wasn't a... It wasn't a complete switch, was it? Uh, an overnight switch. But they also made other mistakes uh, in that <clears throat> the, the, they built the Afghan military in the mold of the U.S. military, heavily reliant on contractors. But most of the contractors were U.S. government contractors. When, when the Americans announced that they would pull out in mid-April, the contractors left within a week or two. So they could not service the aircraft and maintain them. Um, they could not get ammo out to... Uh, units across the country. Even on policy, in, on policy and planning and strategy, there was a huge vacuum left because the Americans were so closely involved. Post-April, the Americans basically said, hey, we're getting out. You're on your own. And I, I think that they said it in a nice way on the ground, but the, but, the, but the policy was set in Washington. And this throughout this, you know, this period between April and August, only four months, mm. there were no serious attempts uh, to bridge these gaps in terms of how to help the Afghan military. And of course, I mean, it's always more than that. It's more complicated. The Afghan government was also fairly inept. Not fairly, it was quite inept mm. in terms of, you know, choosing the right people to command, choosing the right ministers and so forth. So it was a combination of failures that contributed to this, to that disastrous uh, August 15th collapse. Is there a conversation that you remember at that sort of, you know, senior level in Washington? Were you able to vent your fury at any point in advance or since? <clears throat> well, I mean, I think you have to be pragmatic. You know, we, we, we can't afford just to be angry or mm. happy for that matter. And I think it's got to be like, you know, what, what's the issue? What are the issues? But I, I had conversations with obviously senior government, U.S. government officials and, of course, U.S. Uh, senior Afghan officials, including the president himself, who was completely delusional. Um, you spoke to him before he... Before he Left, I spoke to him left, two weeks left, be, left before the country the, for UAE. UAE. Yeah, yeah, two weeks before the collapse of the government, and I went to see him twice actually within 24 hours. <clears throat> and he somehow, I mean, the the, the 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 country wasn't you know collapsing around him, and yet he believed that he would prevail. This idea, and at that time, even months before that, our thinking was that you have to go and seriously negotiate with the Taliban with the view of giving up power and creating some sort of an interim arrangement. You told him that? Uh, well, I, t I told him that in November of 2020, before the U.S. elections, I think a day or two before the U.S. elections, in October of 2020. Um, but, but by July, late July of 2021, which is the last time I saw him, um, it, was, it was a question of, it was the nuclear option. Hmm. And at that time, the interim administration wasn't, uh, wasn't, you know, on the cards, basically. It was too late for that. So it was yeah. about, you know, how do we transition so we don't have, you know, anarchy uh, in Kabul and across the country. Which you met him, you met him in his bunker, effectively. I met him in the palace. Yeah. But the palace was, the presidential palace in Afghanistan, which is the, royal, the old royal palace, is very serene, very beautiful, beautiful gardens. You're so detached yeah. from, you know, Afghanistan, the country, that within a kilometer or two, it's just chaos, you know, traffic, jams, people screaming at each other, you know, full of people. And then, in the, in the, in the, and yet in the palace, it's just serene. It's and completely it's, detached from it's, reality. It's completely, if you want to go, you know, and meditate, that's the place where you go and meditate, basically. It's so peaceful. So <clears throat> I think that that has an impact. You know, I think that isolation has an impact. Yeah. I mean, he was a deeply flawed man. He should, have, he should not have been the president. And uh, it was even questionable how he became president. There was a lot of fraud in the elections in um, 2014. And then, of course, also in 2019. But, um, but anyway, I mean, you know, we, we can look back and shake our heads. But, you know, it is what it is, right? Um, let's go back, sir, to your... Um to your decision to devote so much of your energy and life uh, back into Afghanistan. Um, you've been working, as I said, in finance very successfully. There were, you know, all number of options open mm. to you in terms <coughs> of your profes professional, uh, professional future. Um, but you decided that Afghanistan was where you would 
build your business. Tell me about that choice. What, what sat behind it? Well, um, you know, for you know, you mentioned that my father was a diplomat, and uh, we, you know, had lived outside of Afghanistan. It was London, Islamabad, Tokyo, for many, many years. Um, but yet, somehow, you know, we were not like your typical immigrants in that we left Afghanistan and we were content to, you know, start a new life. For us, we were always Afghans. We spoke Persian at home. Um, and we remain very sort of connected to our country and our culture and, uh, and, and our people. So <clears throat> in, the, in the 1990s, if you recall, the Russians left in 1989. The communist regime sort of somehow survived till 1992. And then all of a sudden, um, that regime collapsed. And then we had the freedom fighters, the Mujahideen, who prevailed and took power in Kabul. There was a brief window that a lot of people thought, well, hold on, this is the new Afghanistan. We could go back and do something mm. in the country. And many people did not go back. So, and then what followed was, you know, was, was a sort of a nasty civil war. Kabul was totally destroyed. And that essentially is what led to the creation of the Taliban um, in the 90s. But anyhow, a lot of us who witnessed that felt that if there was ever another opportunity to go back and do something, we'd go back. And and you know after 9/11 and the uh, and uh, the invasion of the country and this new government that was that was put together in Bonn and then of course then um, through various local assemblies was was endorsed by the, by, by by the Afghans. Um, so sort of provided provided us with that opportunity to go back and do what we could. But it was opportunity in crisis, though, wasn't it? Yes, I, I mean, think it was. It was. It was a country in crisis. But crisis always provides you with an opportunity. Yeah, you believe that? I know. I believe that. You know, the the the, the 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 crises of everything uh, provides you with an opportunity. So, we thought we should go back, and we went back in two thousand and two. The idea was not to go back and live there full time. The idea was to invest and to stay engaged. Um, and uh, but then we set up this radio station, which was very controversial, and sort of it, it sort of sucked us all in, basically. Mm. Um, you created a you know a modern uh, populist radio station, right? It's you like were, a like a like a fun music chat chat music, some news yeah. radio station. It was very controversial um, and very popular, by the way. And we got dragged into it kicking and screaming. But it wasn't by design, I have to tell you. I mean, it was just, it was almost an accidental business, as many things happen in life. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, that led to the first TV station and then other TV stations and other platforms and so forth. And then going outside the country, of course, as well. But, uh, but yeah, it was, it's, you know, the 20 years went like, it was a, like a flash, basically. What does it say about your personal makeup, do you think? The decision to, you know, because you're, you're right, you identified a commercial opportunity mm -hmm. and there was the emotion of the fact that mm -hmm. it was Afghanistan had been an important place in your heritage and in your mm -hmm. life. But what does it say about your makeup that you were so keen to run towards what you knew would be a very, very challenging, mm -hmm. you know, business environment, let alone, you know, kind of spending time living there? It was wonderful to be in Afghanistan. Um, it's a it's a quite a magical place. Uh, Kabul, in particular, is a is a is a is a great city, um, high altitude city, surrounded by hills. Um, it's sort of the garden city of Central Asia, where Babur, the man who conquered India, the founder of the Mughal Empire, wanted to be buried in Kabul. Um, and um, so it, it has something about it. Uh, I have no doubts about it. And others who visited, you know, foreigners as well as Afghans agree with me on that. So I think it was a magical place to be in. But of course, post-2001, all the action was in Afghanistan. Mm. It was that sort of the model country that the world was going to transform. So there was a lot of excitement, lots of diplomats, lots of activity, lots of business. But I think it's, it's, it's you know, there's so many young people nowadays talk about, you know, the, their careers and, you know, wanting to become bankers or finance people or IT people, technology people. But I think at the end of the day, you know, mostly attracted by the financial rewards. But I think you also have to, you have to have some passion for what you're doing and what you're embarking on. And I think, you know, we were passionate about a lot of, a lot of things, but Afghanistan in particular, we were very passionate about. But there was also, there was this enormous opportunity for us to shape things, um, you know, in a positive way and contribute to the, 
you know, reconstruction of the of the country. So it was it was it was exciting, amongst other things. The childhood years that you spent in Afghanistan, um, bright memories of that of that period of your life, and when you went back mm. as a as a businessman. That was in your mind as well. That kind of reconnection with your with your with your past in that way and with your childhood. Are there, you know, most people's childhood memories are wonderful. I mean, yeah. for us, it was they were mostly wonderful. Uh, but you know, there were occasions, especially towards the end, when the communists took over the country, uh, where I witnessed, you know, uh, fighting on the streets. I mean, it was jarring and uh, tell me a bit um, traumatic. About, tell me a bit more about that. You're what age at this stage? So I'm I'm twelve. And I think 12 and three days. Mm. And it's a Thursday, which is our equivalent, you know, your equivalent of a, of a, of a, of a Friday. So the weekend's ahead. And, um, and, you know, they had not celebrated my birthday because it happened during the week. So the idea was on th Thursday uh, after school that friends and family would gather in my house and would celebrate my birthday. So it was, it was an important day. Um, but two days before, or a day before, the president had, at that time, Dawood, had arrested his, basically, his sort of coalition partners of sorts. He had basically had uh, forged this sort of unholy alliance with the communists to topple his cousin, who was king of Afghanistan, and created this, this re republic, well, a name only. Mm. Uh, he was a king, but you know, as you know, uh, cloaked in a, a, a president's outfit. But then, the, but then he tried to tried to move against his communist allies, and he had them all arrested. And then, on that fateful day, I think it was 25th of April, uh, 1978, they struck back, and they basically there was a coup, um, and they toppled Dawood, killed his family, and many of his closest. Um, individuals and then the communists took over for two years and then the russians invaded in 1980 but so what i witnessed as a 12 year old was that our school was right next to the president's um, office so the presidential palace um the french lycée which i attended as a seventh grader mm -hmm. and then there was this fighting and you know people there were shots being fired and then the school basically they, they had no option they just opened the gates and kids ran out what i did was i did ran the, out with the sound of gunfire in your uh, yeah. ears and the right. windows you know uh, breaking and so forth obviously the fire you know because they were, they were attacking it from all directions from the air from the ground we couldn't see where the bullets were coming from but certainly there was there was a lot of shooting oh my god <clears throat> and then what i did was we left the school i went the opposite direction i wanted to see where my mother was because at that time i think she was working at the ministry of planning and I went to the square there was, there was a, the, where there was heavy fighting. Um, and then for me as a 12-year-old, it was very traumatic because, A, I wasn't, sur I wasn't sure what was happening to my mom. And secondly, you know, to see people, which I assume were dead on the ground, having been shot. And then I ran back, which I think would have been three or four kilometers for a 12-year-old. Um, so as fast as I could, the other direction, caught the bus, went home. And then, of course, my mom was there and the family was there and everyone was safe. But I think it was traumatic for, for a 12 year old to have to witness that because don't forget up until 1978 Afghanistan had not experienced anything like that mm. we were unaccustomed to violence to fighting to you know to anything that resembled as what yes. followed yes so it was it was a it was a scary which is often forgotten right that, that in many ways mm. this is still a very modern crisis yes isn't it the Taliban are a very modern organization right that's right born out of the 90s Born out of, well, essentially born out of West, you know, adventures and trying to create this bear trap for the Soviets. I mean, that, it all started in 1980 when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan and for the West there was an opportunity to make them pay a price, mm. just like the Americans paid in Vietnam. It became the Soviet Union's Vietnam. So anyway, the start, yeah. it started in 1978, April 25, and I was there a witness and then, of course, then the whole afternoon, as when I got home, we could see hundreds of tanks going towards central Kabul mm. to confront the president or whatever resistance there was left. Mm. Um, so it was scary for us. And then the announcements on the radio, a new regime in town and so forth. 
um, it was it was it was a very uncertain period. I guess that's what sat behind my earlier question is that for a, a lot of people who would have experienced mm. that as a twelve year old, they would have had the reverse. It would have it would, it would have caused them to think in a in a, an entirely different way to to the way that you thought. Yeah. I think a lot of people having experienced that as a 12 year old would have thought, well, that's that, as, as much as I love my country, as much as I have also positive memories, and I have this attachment to this place, this beautiful place. This is not where I'm going to build, this is not where I'm going to build my life with those memories in, you, in mm. your mind. But you didn't, you went, you went back. And the motivation for that, I know, business mm. aside, the motivation for that is because you felt you could put things right in some way that actually there was a real opportunity for real and lasting change is that what was driving you well i think you think and maybe it's you know once you know maybe we're, we're maybe i'm delusional that you can contribute in your own small way i think that's probably perhaps one but it's it's, a, it's also you know you're part of something much bigger and i think that's also interesting you know there's you know the country and you know we i have to mention is that over the last two decades the country the people have changed it's a totally transformed country. Um, the West may feel, see its role in Afghanistan as a failure, but they succeed in terms of educating people. Life expectancy has gone up by 50%. Infrastructure has been built, but Afghans themselves see themselves differently. You know, you're dealing with a much more sophisticated, better educated populace. At median age of 18, youngest country outside of sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. Population is still growing at 3%, two, two and a half, three percent 40 million people today, 20 million in 20, 2002, 20, 40, 20 million to 40 million in two decades, and expected to go up to about 100 million by 2060 or 65. It'll be the 16th largest country in the world if you know, the, the birth rates continue. So it's a transformed country. And I think, you know, um, I think for the better. And I think that even today, if the Taliban are in Kabul and some engaging with people and you know they can they see people they deal with them on a daily basis mm. they, you know i think the people are also impacting the taliban in terms of you know how they see things and how they perceive things so but anyway it was it was yeah it was jumping into the fire i think in a lot of ways um and and i i think you can either get paralyzed and just walk away from it or you can go back in um so but we've, we've gone back in a couple of times yeah yeah, and you're still there now. Yes. Uh, which we'll get on to. Um, so let's go to January 20th, 2016. So we're shooting right forward here. A terrorist attack uh, targeted your team at Tolo, your mm. TV station. Um, can you tell us what happened on, on that day? You know, we had done a story. There was a, there's a city in northern Afghanistan called Kunduz. Um, the Taliban briefly took over the city. And... And then they were dislodged and pushed back by Afghan allied forces. But there was a there was a building where a lot of female students would stay at, basically. Um, it's like a boarding house. And what had happened was that the Afghan intelligence agency had told our reporters that this um, that some women had been attacked and so forth. And that our guys had reported that story, quoting the the Afghan intelligence uh, sources. Now, we discovered that the girls were not there. You know, that it was during their break and that fled the city way before the, uh, the Taliban showing up. Um, and they sort of basically corrected the story in subsequent uh, bulletins, but the Taliban wanted a specific apology for that. And our editors, and you know, we you know, have over the years have not interfered in their day-to-day -day work, were adamant that they had done things by the book. But the Taliban took that very seriously. And basically a fatwa was issued to punish us and our employees. Now, I think attempts were made to, you know, to discuss this with the How Taliban. How was that first communicated to you? They issued a statement. Yeah. You know, they issued a statement of, you know, audio messages and then a proper fatwa with a statement that accompanied that. So we were on guard and we understood that this threat was imminent. And then, of course, m meanwhile, we, you know, we talked to the government in terms of better protecting us and our people, as well as talking to the Taliban, saying this, is, this makes no sense, and trying to you know, 
to argue with them because we always had a relationship with the Taliban as, mm. as a media organization does. But then on, on January the 20th, um, they had followed our bus. We had dozens of buses that would transport the employees to their homes. And a taxi filled with explosives basically ran into the back of this bus. Um, and that resulted in seven um, seven of our employees dying, being killed on the spot, and 15 injured, some badly, but some permanently, actually. And at that time, I was in Bombay and Mumbai, and, and, you know, we reported on the story that there was an attack on a bus, casualties unknown, and then we would update the story, you know, throughout the evening. So basically, that story was covered by us, not knowing exactly know who was on the bus. Who's on the bus? And then, of course, one of my employees rang up and said, "Listen, I can't reach people. Uh, I think this is connected." And I, as soon as he said that, I knew that this was perhaps the attack we were, you know, fearing, hoping to 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 not experience or not to face. So then I just called the flight, went to Dubai, called another flight, got up, got up to Kabul by 6 a.m., visited the hospital. Uh, with so many of the injured were being cared for, cared for, and then visiting some of the families of the victims. And these are these are people who've done a whole range of different jobs for Tolo, right? None now, of them know. were news people, ironically. They're production right. people, yeah. um, logistics people, uh, creative people, and they 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 were kids, and some of them had worked for us for years, you know. And they when they when they work for you and you see their faces and you speak to them, they yeah. become like your own members of your own family, your own kids. Mm. So it was, it was very painful for us, but of course more painful for the families because many were the only, you know, income earners in those families. These impoverished, poor Afghans, um, having their kids work, you know, their only hope. Uh, sometimes is you know your your only son who works in an organization or your only daughter and it was a very very painful experience. How did you for manage that so just just from my I mean there's you know uh, as, as the leader of mm. the organization how did you approach uh, you know something that was a, 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 a such a sort of tragic uh, painful uh, exercise that also I suspect perhaps threatened the you know the sort of existence of the chat you mm -hmm. must have must have I imagine caused fundamental questions to be mm -hmm. asked about can we can we continue can we be able to do this when we're under such attack or not did it have the reverse effect did it cr create even more resilience what was the what was your sort of I, I think uh, for me yeah for me um, to I mean I, I, if, if someone asked me if you could save a life and shut down your organization say you know for your employees I'd have to think about that because I think it's I, I cannot I cannot act that stoic and say, hey, we can continue and this is a price we have to pay. For me, it was, I was actually prepared to shut the operation down. Um, and I put this to my employees. You know, we had a meeting in the morning and we assume, we'd given everyone the day off. We, we assumed that only a dozen people would show up. Hundreds of kids showed up. Goodness. And it was cold. It was January. Kabul gets very cold. And I addressed uh, my employees and I said, listen, what, what has happened is tragic. Um, it's, you know, it'll take a while for it to sink in because I think we were still in shock at that time. <clears throat> but I said, we, I am open to the idea of just locking the place up and walking away from it, if you think so. Um, the, the reaction from the employees was quite different. They were much more. They they were angry. They were they were shocked, obviously, but they were more angry than you know. They they, they had not been. They didn't want to. I don't know if they. Maybe they were intimidated. They didn't want to show it, but mm. they seemed much more aggressive. They were much more gun ho, and they wanted to sort of confront this head on, which was also not something we wanted to do because I argued in that meeting that our job is we're a provider of a service the Afghan nation. This is not, we should not be using our platforms and our vehicles as a means to settle score with the Taliban. Right. We are messengers, we're just mere messengers. That's mm. all we do. Mm. Um, 
So it was just to calm everyone down. Everyone was, was adamant that we had, you know, the message was, we want to continue. So you took your lead from them? I, I think, I, I certainly was willing to listen to them. And mm. I think that, and that convinced me that we should, we should continue. Um, it wasn't the only time, though, that you lost uh, people. That you you lost staff. No, subsequent to that, we lost, lost another five, in different you know incidents. Incidents yeah. were reported going into to, to report on a suicide bombing. There's a second one. He's killed with his colleague. Another news story. Another bomb goes off. We lost a photographer. A guy trying to get to the office. You know, a bomb goes off at the German embassy. He's killed. So I mean, you add them all up. It's you know twelve people. Um, so it's, it's, but every Afghan has experienced this. And I think that you talk about how you get through this is that you, you know, I mean, I certainly felt. Every Afghan has, has experienced it. There are very, very few business leaders who have experienced it. But I think every You're... Afghan business leader has experienced it in one form or another. Family getting killed, colleague getting killed, you know. It is part of friends, life. Friends, you know, it's a part of life. Um, and. But I think you also, you put yourself in the position of a father or a mother or a sibling who's lost a loved one. What they go through is far worse than what you would ever experience. Yeah. So I think, and, and they were angry. I mean, they were angry with us because we couldn't protect their kids. They were angry with the management, the senior leadership within the organization. The How did you deal with that, Saad? How did you deal with that, just, that element you, of anger? Well, you just listen to them. And I think, um, and we have a good relationship with all of them now. And we have a, you know, obviously a program where they, you know, try to employ other siblings in the family, continue to, you know, pay compensation and so forth um, to ensure at that time, uh, 21st Century Fox was a partner with, with in Moby. And mm -hmm. they were also very generous in the way that, that uh, they attempted to help us help these families. Mm -hmm. Um, but, yeah, I think you just have to take it on the chin. I mean, their anger is, is under, you know, it's understandable. It's how you um, continue to lead as well, though, how you continue to run a business. Mm. That's my point about very few business people have experienced mm. it, and perhaps not, obviously not in Afghanistan, but, I mean, we talk about business challenges often on this podcast, or we're we're, mm. we're talking to people who are who are trying to navigate the difficulties mm. of of a professional life. It is nothing in comparison to what you've navigated as a business leader. Set aside I, the emotional it, part of it, it, but to to continue to focus on. But also, you're on the spotlight mm. because you're a massive media organization. Everyone hears your story. Everyone wants to know what you're doing. So you you have to be transparent about mm. everything. So it makes it even more difficult. I mean, you know, we, we had a memorial service for our fallen colleagues. Both the president and the previous, you know, the former president showed up as well as the entire leadership. So it was, and it was carried live on television, of course. So it, you know, doing all of these things in the spotlight is, it makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, and, you know, it's, but, with, you know, many people who, go through this sort of thing will tell you. I mean, you take it, you know, an hour at a time, a day at a time, you know, to deal with it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's pretty daunting. I wouldn't want to go through it again, ever. You talked about passion earlier in relation yeah. to the sort of Afghan characteristics. Um, resilience also, right? Obviously, which is something mm -hmm. we talk about a lot on this, on this podcast, is what this podcast is all about. Um, the resilience of the Afghan people is something I, I, I mean, I would, I, I would say something that the rest of us could learn from. Mm. Um, you'd agree with that. Um, and when you talk about how the characteristic of the Afghan nation has changed over the last couple of decades, the resilience is is there, right? It's still there and is as strong as ever. It is, but I'm not sure if it's a good thing or you know. Sometimes I question whether it's good to be that resilient. Right. Right. I mean, how much pain can a nation go through? Um, you know, we, we if you look at the data, it's pretty horrendous you know um, I mean just in this and the you know during the Soviet invasion a million Afghans lost their lives a million handicapped um, seven seven and a half million refugees 
mostly in Pakistan and Iran. Mm. And then subsequent to that, you know, hundreds of thousands of others killed, you know, lots of internally displaced refugees, the mm. humanitarian crises. It's one crisis after another. I think a lot of, I mean, it's not something, it's not, it's the Afghans can say that we are not actually responsible for much, much what, for what we're experiencing today. That's interesting. So, so resilience, th- resilience is the wrong word to use in a way because it's, it, it, it can lead you down a path that is, um, uh, uh, that is, is unfair, frankly, that, that does that, or the, or the, or the camouflages or conceals yeah. what Afghanistan has gone through and endured. Because they haven't had much of a say in terms of their, you know, destiny, so to speak. You know, the Soviets invade, no one asks the Afghans. The Americans and the Saudis and the Western alliances give, you know, hundreds of millions or billions to the anti-Soviet freedom fighters. No one asks the Afghans as to what they want. Then they walk away from Afghanistan. The Soviets leave, the Americans lose interest. And then we have the civil war. No one asks the Afghans. The Taliban take over. They don't ask the populace. The Americans invade. They don't ask. They really ask the Afghans. They remain for 20 years. You know, no one sort of gauges what the Afghans want. Yeah. And then the Taliban. Then, then the Americans decide to leave. No one asks the Afghans. And the Taliban take over. No one yeah. asks the Afghans. So, what, what much of what we experience today in Afghanistan, most Afghans have not had much of a say in. Even the sort of democracy that we had, which was like. You know, I mean, it was just basically, let's give these guys a democracy, but without a proper process, proper, without a proper oversight, you know, and then allowing people to commit fraud. It made a mockery of the entire process. So a lot of Afghans were not that engaged in what was going on in the country. It was, I think it helped, it benefited the country in enormous ways. It helped the economy, it helped the people. People could go to school and university and they could visit clinics and, Maternity wards were full of people. We trained lots of nurses and doctors and so forth. But, but in a lot of ways, were the Afghans truly engaged? And I think it's a question we, you know, you have to ask yourselves. You know, we were a part of that failed t- 20 years. It was successful in some ways, but it ultimately failed. And we were a part of it. And we have to be honest and ask ourselves the same question. Is that, you know, what did we do wrong? Mm. How could we have done this differently? A lesson for the future, perhaps. What answers have you have you reached when you ask yourself those those, those questions? Well, I think I think that we should have taken ownership of things much, much, much earlier. And I think being spoon fed by the international community, with, with you know, by with hundreds of millions of subsidies and grants and assistance, was probably the wrong way of going about it. It only helped corruption, and it created the sort of group of elites that basically skim everything basically from the top yeah but also made a lot of contractors in the u.s and other places very happy and very wealthy um i i think there's a lesson in terms of that even if you bring in something new it cannot be imposed it's going to develop organically whether it's democracy or civil society and so forth and that comes with time so i think i think there was this rush it was just to change a country on steroids. And I think perhaps, and I, you know, I, I, I would say that I was a part, I was a cheerleader for that, for, for, for what we experienced, you know, elections, democracy, um, the creation of civil society organizations. We were part of that too. Mm-hmm. So, but I just think that there was this rush, but I think most important of all was that not dealing with corruption. There was a report by a, um, a U.S. aid watchdog at Rusi um, very recently, a couple of weeks ago, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that said that those, you know, who were running the U.S. aid program during that time just didn't understand the country, and that, and that you know, giving more than what was the gross domestic product of Afghanistan on, a, on an annual basis, just handing over the cash, was was wrong. Was the wrong approach? Is that you? You agree with that? Yes, I think a there was too much money. Mm. You know, there were incidents. For example, the Dutch would dig a well in a village, mm. and then the Japanese would show up also to dig a well. So all of a sudden, these people had two wells, and then a third country would show up, and they would have three wells, where they would only need one. Um, or USAID would. Um, 
10-day road project for $2.5 million per kilometer. They would subcontract to a Turkish company for $500,000. I'm, 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 you know, I don't know if it's 500,000 or, or 700,000, but let's say it was like less than or almost half. And then they would subcontract to an Afghan company for $200,000 uh, per kilometer. So you, you know, for 10%, the cost of the original cost, you'd build a road. So it would collapse in six months or a year or two years when you have extreme temperatures in a place like Afghanistan. So, and then lots of these white elephant type projects were created and funded and were of no real benefit. But the, even if they'd given this money directly to the Afghan government, the Afghans didn't have the capacity to manage this much money. An Afghan actually once compared it to like, like a farmland that you haven't cultivated anything on for centuries mm. and then flooding it with like, you know, fertilizer and water and seeds, you're not going to be able to grow anything. It takes a while to get the topsoil right, to get everything else right. Afghanistan was not quite ready for that much assistance. And that basically fed corruption in the country. Mm -hmm. And there was no, I mean, there was accountability only thanks to people like us, but the judiciary didn't really function. The prosecution was inept. The international community turned a blind eye to things uh, more often than not. So it was, it was just, you know, 20 years of mistakes basically that, which led to what happened on August the 15th. But, but, you know, despite all those mistakes and, you know, and all the, you know, our, our criticisms, I still think the country benefited, the people benefited. It did fall to Dan. Hmm. Was it worth a trillion dollars? No. Um, let's go back just for, just for, just for a sec. Another, another question in relation to the, you know, the, the tragedies that you're enduring as the leader of the business. But I mean, some of that was directed at you as well, right? You've had death threats. Sure. You know, you've had, you know, periods of your life where, you know, you, you know there's a price on your head. Yes. How have you, how did you, how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, even during uh, the Republic days, you know, I had, at one stage, I had like a dozen arrest warrants, um, travel bans and so forth. Right. Because they would find any excuse to build. Just try and explain the context of all that at that stage, because because you... at that time, you know, we're talking about 2005, 2006. As a matter of fact, we started to challenge the government. Uh, corruption was at that time wasn't a major issue, but it was mostly about um, civilian deaths. Uh, night this, is, this is Karzai's government. This Karzai's is 2004, gov first first you know elections. Okay. Karzai's in power. 2004, 2005 yeah. were okay. Yeah. But I think in sort of 2006 and 2007, we started to sort of delve deeply or deeper into what was transpiring across the country. Yeah. And basically, I, I, and I think um, one of the mistakes the government made, and I, I had these debates with Karzai at the time, was they were content to allow thugs and warlords um, or appoint them in key positions both in Kabul and also in the provinces. People, you know, predators, basically. And their predatory behavior and corruption and you led to the Taliban emerging or re-emerging. You know, in 2002, 2003, you, you could not even imagine the Taliban coming back. Mm. There was no appetite in the country in any way for these people to, you know, to come back. I think most villages would have said, no, we've had enough of the Taliban. We're happy with things as they are. But then what happened was that when you have corrupt officials uh, acting in a pre predatory manner, you have then night raids conducted by U.S. forces. You have bombings of villages, which killed hundreds, if not thousands, of civilians in the first two or three years. That basically allowed the Taliban to reemerge. Yeah. It was the mistakes Opened of the, the state. Anger. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, you know, there's an ad adage, you know, and you would know this is that, you know. Um, Governments rarely lose its opposition. You know, oppositions rarely win. Mm. It's governments that lose, whether it's elections or a war or anything like that. So I think we allowed for this to happen. And I remember the first time we did something very controversial. I think it was in 2007, where we interviewed some so-called Taliban. And they said, listen, we don't have any affiliation with Taliban HQ. We're just a bunch of young guys. And there are these thugs in Kabul, and they named names. And, you know, these people have done terrible things in the 90s during the Civil War. 
and the government is aligned with them, and we're going, we're going to resist these people and the people they have appointed in our districts and so forth. And that was really the beginning of you know the comeback of the Taliban. Because I had my brother, I, they, I think they intended to arrest me, but my brother was arrested, our chief legal guy, the reporter, and one other person. So four people were arrested by the Purely intelligence. for reporting on these, you know, what, what, you, what you're seeing in front of your eyes. Yes. It was obvious to everyone. Yeah. So, I, so I was summoned to the palace. And one of my friends said, listen, Karzai's gonna, he's gonna get really angry. He just sits still, listen to what he has to say. And then when he's got everything out of his system, then you can have a chat to him. That's exactly what I did. So he basically said, how could you do this? You've, you've defamed these individuals, these fine individuals in Kabul, and you're, you're challenging the authority of the state. And, and it was a very chaotic scene in the palace. I ended up staying there for four hours. But what happened was, over time, I sort of became myself, and I started to push back on some of these issues. And I told him the story that, um, do you remember the movie, The Marathon Man? Mm -hmm. So, Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman yeah. and Sir Lawrence Olivier. Yeah. And remember, and, and Dustin Hoffman is obviously a man on the run, mm. and Lawrence Olivier is chasing him, if you know the film. Mm. But anyway, Sir Lawrence Olivier is coming down in the lift at the Pierre Hotel in New York, and the lift door is open, there's Dustin Hoffman looking disheveled. You know, he's sweating, he reeks of body odor, and he said, Dustin, he said, what are you doing? He said, I've been sleeping in Central Park, trying to get into this role. Yeah. And he said, Dustin, act, <laughs> act, right? So I told the story to Karzai, and I said, Mr. President, you have to govern, govern. Because if you govern, none of these things will happen. And he got really angry because, you know, here's this sort of, you know, I don't know how old I was at that time, maybe late 30s or early 40s, you know, this smart ass, you know, giving me a lecture and giving me the, all these metaphors and you know, these stories from Hollywood. But, but it was obvious, yeah. even in 2000, 2006 and seven, that their actions were going to lead to this uprising. And yes. it took, it was a slow burn. It took a long time for it to happen. And eventually it culminated in the collapse of a country, of a government that was backed by the entire international community and its military. Did he threaten you directly? You know, Karzai, despite his many flaws, and we've had this sort of combative relationship over the last 20 years, was a believer in free press. Um, as, uh, quite Fund often, Fundamentally? Fundamentally, yes. But also there was the international community, and I think that, mm. you know, we have a safety net of sorts, which mm. is what we don't have civil society, the international community. We had a lot of supporters globally mm. that would come to our aid. And even the times that they were arrested, our people, and there were many, many arrests subsequent to that first arrest, you know, we always had supporters who would come in. But yeah, I mean, it, there was always the threat. It was implied and direct, you know, that we're going to shut you down, we're going to put you behind bars, you know. So worse? Have you had worse threats directly? Oh, people would always call us, I mean, and then threaten us. There were these, like, zero, these CIA-backed um, zero units in Afghanistan that would do horrible things to people, horrendous things, and the New York Times did a whole bunch of reports on them. Uh, and someone from that unit once called me and threatened me, pretty directly, which then I took to the president at that time, which was Ashraf Ghani. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was not unusual for people to threaten us. Um, but of course, I mean, you have to how rate you, the... So how do you, how do you, how do you, you know, how, it's a similar question to what I asked in relation to the, you know, the, the terror attacks against your organization. How do you respond to threats? Well, I... What did the, you, how did that cause you to react? No, you, you, you have to be careful. You have to take these threats seriously. The thing that I think gets at you more is, is when they find... Like, for example, they were trying to get us on taxation. Now, that involves years of going to court. And right. it's, just, it's just basically, it's like a war of attrition, basically. Mm. Or why did you air this drama series? It's got a Hindu god symbol, you know, in the scene, in a sort of far right corner that's not even obvious to the, to the naked eye. Things like that. They build cases against you. You're seeing this in India, for example, or a lot of other countries that... Mm that this sort of way of trying to weaken an organization, is, it's, it's, it takes a lot of you know, your bandwidth and energy to deal with. The direct threats, 
I don't know. I think I think you depends on who's making the threat. But but you you got you have to always take him seriously, and you always have to have contingency plans. Uh, but bad things happen in bad neighborhoods, so you have to be prepared for the worst case scenario, including losing your own life. Really? Yes, of course. You've I've, had that conversation with yourself that that is that's something you're comfortable with. I mean, it's funny because you know you know I'm, wrong I, I, I'm it's a, something you come to terms come to terms with. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think you know, you know, I'm I'm doing a lot of research and sort of longevity, and you know, I, I as you know, I run and I exercise, and you know, what vitamins to take. I mean, sure, I'm I'm going to be able to prolong my life by a couple of years, but we're all going to go at some stage, and I think we have to always be prepared for going. This is, you know, this this. I think the the way we are as human beings, we're oblivious to one day going. Mm. But it's just a question of time. So if your time comes before then, not that you would voluntarily but step in front of these You've continued to bullets. put yourself in an environment and to work in an environment and can be you know, immersed in an environment where the chances of that happening are ob have obviously increased or some of your life ending no. prematurely of being increased. And that's something you've come to terms with, is my point. I think if the time comes... And if there's nothing you can do about it, I, I think if you're suicidal, that's a totally different thing. You know, we've, and I'm still alive, I'm 57, but... Well, there is something you can do about it. You can, you can have not, this is what I'm getting at, yeah. you, you could have decided not to have spent yeah. your time, effort, money, energy, professional life, immersed in an environment that is, as you just said earlier, so we tell, we, from one crisis to another. You know, we tell that we, you know, you know, there are a lot of anecdotes and jokes and poetry and how we usually convey a message are through these, mm. these things. And um, there's, a, uh, there's a mental asylum and a doctor goes and visits and there's this madman who puts his thumb on the table and gets a hammer and smashes into it. And then it takes, and he and cries in pain and is taken to the hospital. It takes three months for him to heal. And he observes this guy over a period of 12 months. He does this every three months. He heals. The first thing he does is does this thing. He finally goes to the patient and says, you know what you do. You understand what you do is painful. You know that. He goes, yes. He says, you remember the pain? He goes, yes. He said, why do you do it? He goes, but it feels so good when the pain subsides. Right? So I think for, for us, there's the flip side yeah. of, of, of what we do is that it's, it's, it's gratifying. It's right. very fulfilling. And I, and I, and I, and, and you know, it, it is like, you know, I, I'm, we're not uh, sort of adventure junkies or, you know. Uh, are, you like, are you sure there's not a little bit of that? Well, no, because I think we try to be very logical. We don't, you know, we don't stand in front of like, you know, uh, bullets, for example. We, we don't do anything that would seem suicidal. I think we, we have a very logical, professional approach to what we do. Uh, it's there's there is you know a method that's methodical in, in its own ways uh we try to mitigate as much risk as possible and um we've made mistakes no doubt um but you know we try to learn from those mistakes and uh especially risk to our employees i think to, to how to mitigate those risks is, 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 a, is always a priority for us even in today's taliban regime is how to keep those people safe yeah while they're do doing their jobs. I'd like to talk about that. Tell, tell us about the day that the Taliban returned, Saad, because, I mean, they turned up at the office with guns, right? I mean, it was, it was an immediate intervention. Well, firstly, ev everyone in Afghanistan has got a gun. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, we were expecting them. As a matter of fact, when Kabul was collapsing, many of us reached out to the Taliban and said, you better come in, take over the city, because there's no one else running it. And the concern we had was, you know, weeks or days of looting and murder and mayhem. Total lawlessness. Yeah. Total lawlessness. They stepped in and they came into our compound. I was actually, had someone give me live updates on the telephone. Where are you at this time? I'm in London mm -hmm. at the time. And, um, and they were very respectful. They came in. They, they asked us if we needed something, if we were safe. And then they left. And then, of course, slowly, and then as, you know, the government formed and they had a minister and deputy minister and a spokesperson and media relations people, they started to engage a bit more. Um, but it was, it, was, it was a difficult, confusing time because we were not quite sure. 
what awaited us, what fate awaited us. And, you know, the biggest challenge for us was not the Taliban, it was actually losing people. Because every single day, between the 15th of August and the late, end of August, as the Americans are airlifting people from the airport, people would literally disappear. You'd mm. be sitting in a studio, the guy from behind the camera would just leave. Mm. And get, you know, someone would tell him, listen, you're on some list, we're going to fly you out. He'd go to the airport. In, in practical terms, how do you approach that then? So you got a number you can call? How does one call the Taliban when you're in London? How do you start the conversation with them? Well, it was people on the ground. Yeah, in the first instance. In the first instance. Yeah. And there were relationships, you know, the Taliban always Existing had... Existing relationships with, that you're able to... Yeah. Um, and then others who came in and they had numbers and they, you know, they settled in Kabul. You know, they got a house, they got a car, they got an office, they got new phone numbers. Um, it's ironic that many of the Taliban leaders had not seen each other for a long time. You know, uh, they, you know, it was a... You know, they had cells operating independent of other cells. So it was also, they were getting to know each other pretty right. well in the cabinet forming and all of that. So they were getting to know each other. They were getting to know the people, the non-Taliban uh, institutions and you know organizations and individuals with p people like us. So it was a get to know, there was a get to know each other period of about a year. Were you surprised by their approach? Is it the approach that you expected? Mm -hmm. Yes. In terms of a dialogue that you were able to have with them? Well, I, you know, there were pleasant and unpleasant surprises. The pleasant surprise was that, you know, like, I think it's very important to note that the Taliban, although they have a shared ideology and they're very united and their policies will always get the support of the entire leadership, it's not a monolithic mm. movement, right? And I think um, to hope for the Taliban to fragment and for them to pursue different policies is perhaps naive, but there's no doubt that within the movement itself, there's debate usually, and there's you know, there, and there are there are some that are more moderate than others, yeah, or at least pragmatic. So, yeah. engaging with them um, from the outset that made that very obvious. We knew that it's human nature, mm. right? So that you know, some are more conciliatory than others. Um, some are very angry. To, towards people like us, because we were the ones who took music to Afghanistan that had women on television. Um, and that anger is very obvious. They don't want to, you know, for example, there was a unit tasked with protecting us because we still have ISIS in the country, mm. which is a serious threat to, 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 you know, to Afghans on a daily basis. Um, and he made it very obvious that we don't like you guys. You know, but we've been told to protect you and we're going to protect this you. This is one of your very early conversations not my personally, but this this this, the this person in charge of this particular unit that was tasked with protecting us yeah. didn't like us at all. Yeah. But then over time, you know, they sort of forged relationships with folks from our side, and then there was at least dialogue. And I think you know, I think I, I can't recall the last conversation that was relayed to me, but it was like we still don't like you, but you're not a bad person type thing, right? So. You know, there's a softening uh, on on all sides, and I think it's, that's why dialogue and engagement is important. You don't have to ex accept their ideology, or you don't have to accept their policies, but at least you have this dialogue, which is so important. Two years on, they're in charge, and there's no one serious to challenge them, and the fate of 40 million people is in their hands. Mm. That's why you engage. Yeah. Um, your immediate reaction as a station was to put a Taliban leader on television, interviewed mm. by your female anchor. First time that's ever happened, mm. as I understand it, uh, in Afghanistan. Proper moment of mm. history. Since then, obviously, the ability for female journalists to work and operate, mm. for um, female business people to be able to run. We saw most recently the shutdown of beauty parlors. Mm. Just, just give me a sense of how you have witnessed, uh, you know, the the regression of all of that progress. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was good. It made good television, right? So you do that, and it was just... Were you, surprised that, were you surprised that they agreed to do it? Yeah, but I think he was... Uh, he's now, you know, looking back, I mean, he's one of the more moderate figures. Um, it was an important moment, and, uh, you know, as a media organization, my guys on the ground took full advantage of that opportunity mm -hmm. to, to interview him. Now, obviously... So let me give you the, the, the bad news. The bad news is that 
women have to cover their faces and they wear surgical masks in order to appear on television. And it's, uh, I would say, almost impossible to have a set where you have female and male, you know, interacting and talking and all yeah. of that. Yeah. But they can interview other women, they can interview, you know, teenagers or young kids, that's allowed. The flip side is we've got more women working for our news network than ever before. We, it's gone up threefold. Really? Because we've gone out, out of our way to employ women as producers, as presenters, as journalists. And women still go out, report on issues from across. Are you concerned you know, that that's going to be shut down at some point? Yes. Your, abil your ability just yes. to employ female. Yeah. yeah um, but so then, I mean, again, it's about contingency plans. If that happens, they can work from home. And if they're not on camera, and of course, there's a time that we say, well, enough's enough, we're going to leave. Um, and that is always, always um, on the cards, basically. And the rest of your programming, because over the years, you know, you, you drove the whole yeah. introduction of, of modern progressive entertainment. I mean, there's the, there's the, you know, the, your version of, of what we call pop idol. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Afghan star, there's the Afghan Premier League that you mm. built and introduced, a female Premier League as well, remarkable. All of those things have gone backwards, yes? Um, yes. On, so, so you have to understand that media now is not television or radio, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Right? So we always say that we are platform agnostic. So what appears on the terrestrial networks in Afghanistan is limited. You know, we have game shows and we have chat shows, including women's town hall type meetings, um, which are very informative, very interesting, very challenging in terms of what's the idea of Islam and women's role in Islam and all that. Those sorts of debates happen all the time. It's mm. quite extraordinary. Mm. I was joking with an Indian friend that even today, Afghanistan, there's, there's more freedom to challenge the state than there is in India to challenge the Modi government. In a lot of ways, you know, we just interviewed the Minister of Defense, the son of the founder, Mullah Omar, extraordinary interview with English subtitles. You'll see how the reporter pushes back on so many issues. Right. So... <clears throat> the clock is ticking on that stuff as well, right? You, you, you fear that that's going to be... Maybe and maybe not. Because, as I said, if, if they silence every media outlet and there's only the state broadcaster, then this sort of mono, not so monolithic movement will have no other option. You know, there are other individuals who would want to have other media mm. that they could, they would be able to mm. convey their messages through. So I think it's in their interest, in their individual interest, to have a relatively free media uh, um, environment. But the other thing, Andy, which I think is important, is that Afghans can continue to watch music clips, can continue to watch soap operas, can continue to watch all these things, on YouTube or on satellite or on other platforms. Those things still exist. And and they can't stop that. And they can't stop that. Mm. And, you know, the genie's out of the bottle now. Mm. And I think that's why there's no going back. Uh, you know, for them, for the leadership at least, education and women's issues has become sort of their key thing. You know, how do we create more religious madrasas? How do we deprive women of education? That's for the leadership. But people, Afghans are finding ways to educate their girls. Afghans are finding ways to learn online. It's not, it's not the end of the film yet. You know, it's just the beginning. How do you think this film might end then? I think it'll end well. I think that it's, it's, I, I, you know, I, the people have changed too much. And I think you talk about the resilience of the Afghan nation. They're survivors. They'll find ways to survive in this environment. And that's why the world cannot turn its back on the country. But there's survival and there's progression, isn't there? There's, there's, there's progress. You have to survive first before you progress. Yeah. But then I think they will take that leap fairly quickly after they've survived. Um, you've said, Saad, um, that you... I alluded to it in the intro, that, um, that the US kind of wishes that Afghanistan would just disappear. Do you fear that they're not alone in that thought? You touched on it earlier in terms of the UK government, but you fear that there are other governments in the West who essentially think the same but just won't say it? I think everyone. I think this is the problem. 
I think that there's individuals within these governments care deeply about Afghanistan, especially the ones who visited the place and traveled and met people and so forth. But yeah. I think... Or who were in the military. Or who were in the military. But but I think for for governments, it's it's, you know, there's limited upside and lots of downside. And I think that the, 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 they will always make that calculation. You know, what do I have to gain? And what do I, what could I potentially lose? So let's just say if you're sitting in the White House, you've got elections coming up in 2024. What could you gain from engaging a bit more? And, you know, what are the pitfalls? So I think the answer to that would be, listen, we'll throw a bunch of money when it comes to humanitarian assistance on the political stuff. We're just going to turn our back on it. But I think they should be forced to deal with the situation that they helped create in a lot of ways. How do you how do you begin to sort of make that happen? Well, I, I you know, I don't, at a time I, I don't, at a time, by the way, which is the other, you know, the other obvious challenge when there are other conflicts. Obviously, Ukraine front of mind yeah. right now. Attention, never mind money, is elsewhere including the media's attention, yeah. you know, getting the media back engaged and interested in Afghanistan again is going to be more and more difficult, isn't it? Well, I think if Afghanistan was to fall apart, which it could, uh, it, it would be what people saw in Syria on steroids. Mm. You would have a massive refugee problem, and they'll be in Europe somehow. You'll have a massive drugs problem, which will get to Europe somehow, which because it always has. Mm -hmm. You'll have, you know, issues with radicalism, with things you saw in Syria, but it'll be far, far worse. Every movement on the planet will be based out of Afghanistan. It would destabilize the entire region from Pakistan to Central Asia to the Middle East. So I think it, it vital Western interests will, uh, you know, could be in jeopardy basically if 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 they do not focus on Afghanistan mm. or refocus on Afghanistan. I mean, forget about the internal issues in terms of, you know, 20 to 30 million people on the verge of starvation, you know, women suffering and so forth. Even if you just forget about those, you know, the, the domestic considerations, domestic Afghan considerations, there are enough issues that could impact the globe uh, that would warrant um, re-engagement of sorts with the, with the current regime. We started with opportunity in crisis. If you set aside all the moral obligations that you've just, and the security obligations that you've just set out, where's the opportunity in Afghanistan now? Well, the opportunity is to make a success out of this, you know, quote unquote failure. Because I think that the country, in, in, you know, from where I sit, has been a success over the last 20 years. Because, you know, much of that assistance filtered down, people or better educated, more lives sophisticated. Have, lives have changed. Lives yeah. have changed. People live longer, for example. People understand civil society. They understand debate. They understand f freedom of expression. Afghanistan, this Basque case of a country, was really transformed uh, by the 20 years of engagement, international engagement. And I think with the Taliban in charge, you know, and, you know, they've, you know, let's not also forget about their attributes in terms of dealing with corruption, drugs, and bringing security back to the country because, you know, they were doing half the fighting and they're not no longer fighting with anyone. So I think it's, there is an opportunity. I mean, I, I don't think we'll be sort of, we're not going to have women in mini skirts like the 1960s anytime soon, but it could be better than what we have today. And, and I think for the world, an engaged Af open Afghanistan, you know, if the Taliban have a relationship with the rest of the world, it would potentially open up the country to tourists, to people setting up schools, to people traveling back and forth. And that naturally opens a country up. Saad, fascinating. Thank you for coming in uh, and talking us through um, for what is, a, what is a, 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 an astonishing story of crisis from uh, so many different perspectives, geopolitics right the way down to you know, how on earth do you run a business in the midst of that kind of environment which you've done very successfully and uh, and I hope will continue to do. I know that that kind of question that you mentioned earlier will be here for as long as we can be here is a question I suspect that you're asking yourself pretty regularly. But thank you for coming in, I really appreciate it. We're going to end as we always do by asking you for your crisis comforts. These are three things that you've always leaned on 
uh, during the uh, during the tougher days, um, what would you give us? Well, I think humour is very important to have a laugh. Um, I always run. Uh, important to clear your head, and I always listen to music, classical music. I listen to Rachmaninoff, Mozart, Beethoven. While you're running. Or when I'm not running. <laughs> Both. <laughs> So fantastic. Thanks for coming in. Really Thank appreciate you. it. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a rating and a review. It really helps. And if you hit subscribe, wherever you download your podcast from, you'll find loads more useful crisis conversations. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok, and you can watch the full episodes on YouTube. Just search for Crisis What Crisis Podcast. You can also find full transcripts of this and every episode on our website, crisiswhatcrisis.com. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you.